This special story is brought to you by our sponsor, Kate Spade, New York. Okay, you guys know how we feel about summer. It is not always easy breezy. Sometimes it's sweaty, frizzy, and if it is us, you know there's going to be bug bites, (laughs) among other things. (laughs) Bring us back to fall. Why are we so anti-summer? We really shouldn't be. You know what? Because we spend so much time in the city, the subways, the scents, all of that, we're looking for a little bit of escape, a little bit of convenience, you know, that that goes out the window once the temperature hits like 90. I guess, but I try and find a little bit of like fun and adventure even here in New York City, and it always just backfires, remember? No, but it's there to be found. It's there to be found. Okay, I had adventure, but do you remember, it was, I think it was two summers ago, I went out to Jones Beach Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm so romantic. Me and Eric are going to take a bike ride out. It was like a big, long bike ride, gotten some exercise. Isn't there something like very sexy sometimes about doing like a sport with a loved one? Like you get a little adrenaline going, whatever. So we're biking through. I've never done that, but keep going. <laughs> we're biking through like these nice little back roads to get to Jones Beach where we're going to go to the beach. And all of a sudden, like, I guess Eric biked over Do mosquitoes have hives? I don't think they do, but like whatever he biked over stirred up a mosquito swarm. I don't know how else to describe it. I ended up with, all right, longtime listeners are going to remember the number and I don't, but I think it was 37. Do you remember what I looked like? I had 37 bug bites. And then I found out later they were tiger mosquitoes. Oh my God. Because we don't have normal mosquitoes here in New York City. Oh my God. It was my summer of misadventure. (laughs) <laughs> the summer of misadventure. Oh my gosh. Well, so this summer, listen, we're going to be more prepared. We're going to look like those people who have it together. We're going to wear white. We're going to have cute little outfits. And we're <gasps> going to pack the perfect beach bag. <sighs> I got a new one from our fabulous sponsor, Kate Spade, New York. It's black and tan crochet raffia. It has the perfect strap drop. It's really cute. It's very me. It's neutral, so it goes with a lot of my things. And you look polished. I I love polished. this idea of packing the perfect summer bag. I feel like there's so much you can't control in life. Like having everything you need in your bag is like key. So I'm just going to share a little bit of what I'm putting in my bag this year. I really think it's going to help. I'm not going anywhere without Band-Aids. I'm not going anywhere <laughs> without like shout wipes in case I get a mm-hmm. stain. Eric's very into white denim this summer. Great, Eric. You know what gets really dirty? White denim. White denim. Oh. This man really is a, a, a works at a men's style fashion magazine. Well, he does work at Esquire. Yeah, and yeah. I got yeah. these little cutter mosquito wipes. And sell it, it's the insect repellent in a white form, so I can like if we're just gonna you know something off the cuff and we do something out in the woods, I will be prepared. I always have my sunscreen, you know, a little little essential oil. So in case I want to need to do some breathing exercise, you know, how people are always like take deep breaths to help yourself like yeah. chill in the summer. I like to put a little like roll on on my palms and breathe in through them and breathe out. Do you like that for me? It's funny. I just stocked up on my Tata. Oh yeah, mine's Tata Harper. Yeah. (gasps) They're so good. They're so good. Okay, I'm going to put those in my Kate Spade New York bag. And I think Mm -hmm. that'll be, I'll be ready to have an excellent summer. And we hope you're all inspired to have an excellent summer. Pack your own little summer survival kit. Treat yourself to a new bag from Kate Spade New York. They have this incredible summer collection. Now, it's their 30th anniversary and their summer of adventure, not misadventure, of adventure. And they've got all sorts of new clothing, accessories, including a reissue of their iconic sandbag that started it all back in 1993. You can shop their entire collection on katespade.com. And thank you again to our sponsor, Kate Spade, New York. Okay, everyone, it's Friday, Fat Mascara interview day. I'm Jess. I'm Jen. Hi, welcome to Fat Mascara. Ooh, we have a good interview for you. So, I, Jen, yeah, who'd you talk to? I, P.S., Jess will be, you have an interview coming up too, a solo one. I am so it's excited. It's time to time. Yeah, but I got to connect with Dr. Afia and Bill Ashaka. Let me tell you, what a force she is. What a cool combination of Studies she has. I'm like, all right, let me. I'm. 
I'm getting too excited about it without telling you. lost your mind with the studies. Who the woman is and what she does. I kind of did. I kind of did. It was like all of Jen's worlds colliding into one interview. I was very excited. She's a therapist, consultant, research scientist, speaker, hair historian, and hairstylist with a private clinical practice as a therapist. She's actually also a hairstylist and has a hairstyling practice. That's on pause right now. She'll, She'll explain. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, has a PhD in clinical psychology from Howard University. Wait, another and UPenn graduate? Yes, we bonded. We like, oh, I, we didn't quite overlap, but we had some similar, like we had studied okay. with some of the same people when we were there, which was interesting as well. But the company she founded is called Psychotherapy. She uses hair as an entry point for mental health services in beauty salons and barbershops, as well as through social media. I, she came to my attention from Maui Moisture, which gave her this big grant, which is amazing, to help her with her research. But in her research, she found that black women are more likely to book a hair care appointment than a mental health appointment. And so she collected data from hair salons and barbershops in the Washington, D.C. area where she used to live to give further evidence to this relationship between hair and mental health. So she and I are going to dig into that relationship and what it means, but also talk some hair history and also talk about how to have a healthy relationship with your hairstylist or barber from your end, not just their end, because we need to be kind to them as well. So it's a really great conversation. I'm so excited for you to meet her. Let's get into it. Dr. Afia Mbilashaka, welcome to Fat Mascara. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh my God. I feel like we have so much to talk about, so many interests in common. I love your work. Also, what an interesting field of study you've concentrated on. We're going to get into all of that. But first, I have to get to know you a little bit. So tell me, where did you grow up? What's your family like? Okay, so I grew up in Long Island, New York. My family definitely was the Huxtables from The Cosby Show. I was Rudy. (laughs) So kind of this black professional family and everybody's doing great things. I even had a sister at Princeton, just like on The Cosby Show. So this sort of highly successful, cute (laughs) family that I've come from. And how many brothers and sisters or just that sister? So I'm the youngest of four. So I have two brothers and one sister. Full on Huxtable vibes. Okay. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> now you have the, you have part of your career has to do with the beauty industry and beauty a little bit, but like growing up, what was the first beauty related experience you remember? I would say my earliest beauty memories include my mom doing my hair on Sunday nights. Mm-hmm. That was wash day. And so being the youngest of four children, this was probably the one time of the week where I had that one on one time and attention for my mom. And so she really went hardcore into this wash day routine where she would fill up the bathtub, clean me up, but like really do an intense scrub of my scalp and detangling of my hair. And then getting out of the tub, she was very, very empowering of me in terms of how I wanted to look. So even being like six years old, my mom's like, how many braids do you want? And for me, that was like the most exciting question to answer that I got to choose the number of braids. So sometimes I'm like seven or four and she'd be able to create these sort of fractals of braids on my head. And as an opportunity for me to look in the mirror after, like, I love it. So I think that that's very early positive memories that I had in getting my hair done by my own personal hair stylist, my mom. Oh, that's sweet. And I feel like you're like maybe an 80s, 90s babies. Please tell me about the accessories. What were we closing off the braids with? Did we have the rainbow barrette pack, the little balls? Of <laughs> what course, were we doing? Of course. And so <laughs> I got to pick the color of those too. So in terms of that, we call them bubbles, right? So putting them on the top and then on the bottom of my hair, but to coordinate for the week. That if it was like sort of a pink week, my mom would put pink pink barrettes and pink bubbles in there. Usually she braided my hair down to the end. So and it didn't get loose, so we didn't always need to have the bottom accessory, but definitely the at the top, okay, the bubbles, it. usually a, a pink oh my God, or a the purple. bubbles. Remember how hot they were, those two? Like, they look like marbles, and yes. you'd wrap, and then you had to pop the one inside the other? That's what it is. That's what, what I course. wore. Looking back, how come that didn't hurt my head when I was sleeping, now that I'm thinking about it? Because I always had them in there, but maybe oh, I just yeah. had a, a cool sleeping style that it didn't bother me <laughs> to sleep in those I things. used to love the sound they made. You know, when they would click together? Yeah. Oh, very satisfying. So you have this lovely experience with hair being empowering, gives you a sense of agency as like a little six-year-old who doesn't get a lot of power in her life usually. That's wonderful. And then like intimacy with your mom, right? 
Exactly. And again, positive, affirming, gentle. My mom wasn't aggressive. I wasn't tender headed, but she wasn't like hitting me with a comb or a brush, which is a lot of people's stories. But she used it as a time to be gentle and nurturing. So it was positive. Okay, so we're going to get back to the hair because you are a hairstylist yourself now, but clearly you were like overachiever, your whole family. You went to study psychology of multiple degrees. What interested you in psychology then? Okay, so I had no idea what I wanted to major in after my first semester at Penn. So I went in originally wanting to be a dentist and took all like these math and science classes my first semester, and I hated them all. And so I did something pretty risky. We're at the end of my first semester in college. I said, I don't want to be a dentist anymore. And I let my college roommate pick all of my classes for the second semester of my freshman year. And so she put me into a sociology class, an intro to psychology, a class called Black Women in Literature, and I think Spanish or something like that. And taking intro to psych probably had a hundred, no, 500 students in it. I'm just picturing how big the lecture hall was. And I had Dr. Chate. He was from Australia and he cursed like the entire class and was basically a stand-up comedian because he had the wireless mic and he'd be showing clips and making jokes that I was so entertained. And it made me pay attention and I could see psychology in like everything. And so just ended up taking more and more psychology classes and falling in love with it. But again, I really do credit that professor who I know I never spoke in the class, so he doesn't even know who I am. But I remember him just in terms of modeling how fun learning about psychology could be and how it translates to so many different areas of the human existence. So that's probably an influential piece of how I arrived to this career. And you went on to keep studying, right? You got Did you get a master's in that Yeah, too? So, so what I ended up doing, because I noticed that there were these huge disparities when it came to the field of psychology and the inclusion of Black people. And so I ended up minoring in Africana studies. And so I wanted to go to a school where it would really fuse Africana studies with psychology. So I chose to go to Howard University. So they're, they specialize in Black mental health. And so I ended up applying and getting into a doctoral program without taking any gap year or anything. And so it fused together a master's degree and PhD in clinical psychology. Where does hair play into this, by the way? Because <laughs> okay. like, obviously I'm having you on Fat Mascara because you have this focus in hair now. When did that start? Well, I've always been doing hair. I always loved doing my little cousin's hair at family cookouts. My sister was probably my best hair model. I would get her ready for dates or going out on the town. And I was like a teenager, but doing my sister's hair, who was in her 20s at the time. And I just loved it. To then when I went to college, I was known as the dorm hairstylist. So I lived in W.E.B. Du Bois College House, which was majority African-American student dorm. First of all, I have to pause. We both went to the same school. I had that psych intro. Like, as you're saying this, I can picture your dorm. I know exactly where you lived on campus. I know that lecture hall for psychology. I think that was my original professor, too. I'm sorry. It's just too much. I'm loving it. Yeah, okay, so let's go to Du Bois' house. Let's go. (laughs) And in there... It was, it was just a place to connect with other students, right? In terms of I, people would have a special date or go to some formal or the big football game because it was male and female students that they would come to my dorm room and I'd create braided styles or curl things. But I was not business minded. I never charged anyone. I just liked the creative and communal aspect of doing hair. That, you know, people Mm -hmm. were spilling all the tea to me too. I knew everything that was happening on campus because I was doing everyone's hair. And so it was a really good opportunity to connect. And so I remember being on the phone one day with my aunt Brenda, she's now an ancestor. And I was telling her, I don't know if I want to continue on with psychology or pursue a career in hair. And she said to me, well, why can't you do both? Now, I don't think she was telling me to do both at the same exact time, but that's the way I Mm -hmm. interpreted it and thought, hmm, I can do hair and therapy together. And so that was sort of the birth of integrating the psychology and beauty piece together. It couldn't have been that perfect that you like. (laughs) That sounds like kismet. Brenda was like psychic. Basically, she she was my godmother and my aunt. So let let's go with that okay. that she was psychic. I'll I'll lean into she that. Knew. That she she knew my destiny. She understood my destiny in that way. 
<laughs> and so for for you, obviously, everybody's had the experience. They've sat in the chair of a hairstylist and felt like a release. She's going to touch me. That, that touch feels good. I'm going to unload because we all unload on our hairstylists. But like, what is that connection between mental health and hair? You've gone on to study this more closely. It's not just like someone sits in my chair and I hear all the problems. For you, what is the connection between mental health and hair care? Well, I definitely think that hair is a complex language system. And so as a talk therapist, I'm very mindful of what our hair can express, right? Our hair can express parts of our religious, spiritual beliefs. Hair can communicate maybe our careers. Hair can communicate our relationship status, things like that, that maybe we're not as open and speaking about. Psychotherapy is specifically using hair as an entry point into mental health this is your, care. This is your company, right? Psychotherapy. Yes, yes, it is. Tell me all about it. Okay, so so with psychotherapy, I train hair care professionals and other community members and therapists how to connect hair and mental health. So I developed this 12-hour certification process where I guide hair care professionals into understanding the history of our hair, signs and symptoms of mental illness, and especially understanding how they look a little bit different in communities of color, and then also getting into these micro-counseling skills in terms of how to assess someone for harm, whether harm to self or other, also active listening skills, because unfortunately, some hair care professionals just want to automatically give advice before really fully listening to someone. So there are, I would say, the hardest thing I had to learn as a therapist was how to really listen. And so getting into some of those tools and techniques of active listening, you're great at it, by the way, <laughs> as an active listener. Oh, th- thanks. <laughs> and, then, and then how to impart information. So in terms of this sounds like depression or this sounds like anxiety and being able to talk someone through some of this information. And then finally, how to refer to resources respectfully, right? How do you actually get someone to see a therapist and work through some of that resistance? And even part of the training, I help hair care professionals navigate websites like Psychology Today or insurance company websites to actually get people connected to a ther- therapist themselves. So it's it's a lot of moving parts, but very much a mental health first aid piece in terms of almost like taking a CPR class, but yeah. for mental health concerns. And how has the, the response been in the mental health community? Because I imagine so, since COVID, we've all like become more exposed, I think, to talk therapy. And it can be easy to say, oh, it's talk therapy. Anybody can do it. Or you can't do any harm if you're just actively listening to someone. Have you had any pushback from the mental health community? Like, why are you empowering hairstylists with this knowledge? Or are they happy about that? I haven't gotten any pushback. Good. Only <laughs> only support, luckily. Now, there have been some professionals like, be mindful that being a therapist is a very complicated career. I know that. And so I'm very clear in the training. You all are not therapists. You could be psychotherapists, but you're not therapists. Between going to Penn and Howard, that was 10 years that I studied in school to become a clinical psychologist. And so there's no way that I could translate 10 years of study into a 12-hour course. Now, there are things that are really key and important that I've been able to translate translate and transfer, but it's a growing skill set that takes a lot of practice and feedback. So that's even something that I'm adding now to the curriculum to have these weekly check-in groups with people who are certified to be able to talk about some of the clients or some of their challenges where maybe they feel like they could have tried something else to be able to give advice and support to other people doing this work. And why do you think it's important for hairstylists to have this skill set. Like we also see like a nail tech and we see other people like maybe someone comes to walk our dog. We have all these people in our life that we share services with. But why is it this relationship that you feel is the one where you can be the front lines of mental health? Great question. I do want to acknowledge those other careers should know some mental health information too, though. Dog walkers need to know it. We all need this. It's like, <laughs> yes. we, it's, I know we go, we learn math, we learn trigonometry, which we never use again. Never. And not once in my 12 years of like schooling did I learn psychology or therapy or mental health skills. No, I, I think that hair care professionals have a unique relationship with their clients. They are way more trusted by the broader community than therapist. In terms of the people that you trust so deeply, you don't even need to look in the mirror during the process. There's a Ghanaian proverb that goes, when your sister is your hairdresser, you need no mirror. 
When your sister is your hairdresser, you need no mirror. And it, to me, that really speaks to, we trust these people. And even looking back thousands and thousands of years to even ancient Egypt, we find that in order to be a hairstylist back then, you had to be initiated as a priest because this was seen as such a sacred role and position that you are touching someone's most sacred part of their body, their head. In a lot of traditional African societies, hair is seen as so sacred because it's the highest point on our entire bodies and therefore the most connected to the divine. Our hair is like an antenna and can pick up on energy. A lot of people are told growing up, don't let anybody touch your hair because it's so sacred and special. And so you really need to trust your hair care professional. And they can see things that we can't see, right? I can I cannot look at my own scalp. Uh, it, I've tried. It's, oh, yeah. it's very difficult. But they have certain insight and perspective and even access to your ear, right, to be able to give you certain messages. I've been finding research that says that Black women in particular are way more likely to get their hair done than to go to a doctor's appointment. Like and maybe going to get their hair done twice a month compared to going to a doctor's office might be once every few years. And to think about that opportunity that's happening to be able to lean in to that care. It's very rare that as adults, we get to be washed and bathed by someone else or taken care of in such an intimate way. So I think that people really rely on the nurturing aspect of hair care mm-hmm. professionals during their service. You mentioned some of the the history of this trust relationship in different cultures. I imagine that's like cultures all around the world, there's a connection between the divine and hair. Have you studied that at all? So I'm getting a little bit into it. I do want to label myself as a hair historian, but I've definitely seen a lot of hair information in India, in particular, the people who are considered to be sort of these sages or gurus will not cut Mm -hmm. their hair. They'll, you know, almost grow locks. They won't comb it. And they say that hair is a conduit to the spiritual realm so that if your hair is long, particularly then that kind of attracts and extends your antenna to pick up on things. Or even I've heard for Native Americans back in like the 1800s that they grew their hair really long as a part of connecting to their to nature and their environment. It actually could help them with hunting. And so when Europeans came and began actually chopping off the hair of Native American people, they lost some of their connection to nature and couldn't hunt as well. So there's a lot of information out there pre-colonial time that actually speaks to how rituals are so embedded into hair grooming and hairstyling techniques from birth all the way through death. Yeah. Like, okay, you've got Rastafarian culture has a really big connection there. Then I was like Latter-day Saints. A lot of that community grow their hair really long. I bet if you really look into this, it's everywhere around the world people have had this type of connection. But so that trust that you were talking about between the person that touches your hair and and styles you, it creates such an intimacy. I'm like so curious right now, like back in the day when you might not have the answer to this, but like you didn't have a mirror that you sat in front of, but it seems like a hairstylist would always be behind the person. Is that right? Like, have you ever seen any like community where you braid hair from the front or style hair from the front? I actually have for the Tell Yoruba of Nigeria. Yeah, and the for the Yoruba of Nigeria, each hairstyle can basically again communicate something about the person, whether you're married, not married, whether you have a certain career. And so there's a braiding technique. Well, the stylist will be seated in a chair, and the the person getting their hair groomed sits on the ground facing them and puts their head down. So this allows for braiding to start from sort of the nape of the neck to be able to braid the hair to the front of the hairline. And so these different styles, again, are communicating something about that person, but it's actually easier on the hairstylist's hands to do that technique versus bending. I'll tell you, working in the salon, it is very physically labor intensive. My obliques often hurt because of moving around, but in this having the stylist seated and the person getting their hair done on the floor kind of is more ergonomic um, to some yeah. degree and allows for, for ease. And the person can even fall asleep on the stylist's lap if that's even a, a choice. But there are so many rules and taboos I've even found amongst the Yoruba people in terms of every single girl is taught how to braid hair, but anyone who shows particular talent 
becomes the master mm-hmm. braider for the community. And there's different rules. The stylist shouldn't wash their hands immediately following the braiding or hair care process because you could be washing away someone's good fortune or you shouldn't bargain the price with a hairstylist because if you don't pay her enough, that you'll lose some of your destiny because she keeps it in her hands. We need to spread that one around America. <laughs> <laughs> These are so and and these styles that you're talking about. You mentioned the Yerba community, but have you seen that in other cultures where okay, you can't have that particular style until you're married, or if you're a doctor, you're going to have these buns or these braids? Do you have any examples of that? Yes, yes. I like to study the Maasai of today's Kenya and Tanzania. They have really amazing hair rituals. So even from birth, about seven to ten days after a baby is born, they will shave the baby's hair and the mother's hair. Mm-hmm. This is signaling that this woman just had a baby and she needs extra care and attention and support. So Matt, like, so people who just had babies are rocking the bald, bald look. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's a signal to the community, like, look out for this person. Exactly. And even a lot of West African groups, um, when someone is grieving, they shave someone's hair. Again, it's a signaling this person needs extra care and attention. Even if the hair is not properly groomed and is becoming matted, that is actually seen as a mental health concern that this person needs more more care, more attention than previously. But even going back to the Maasai, they have very powerful warriors. The Maasai warriors are known throughout the globe as being extremely strategic and intentional, but they also, as part of their initiation process, have to grow locks. So they have these sort of micro tiny locks that they grow, and they also have to dye their hair a bright red color, different using different paint and even clays from the earth to get this bright red color. And once they have decided to end their time as a warrior, they have to get their hair shaved. So it's kind of a ritual of disconnecting from that identity. So I just always think about if we did this for our, our warriors in the U.S., if that they had, I guess they had buzz cuts. Right? But in a way we do. Yeah, I was just going to say, remember, I've seen, you know, you go in the military, you shave your head. Yep, exactly. I don't know. That might be a power thing by the military to say you're all the same. You know, they're taking away your power almost. The, the, the it's like uniformity. the opposite. Yeah, I guess. But it's mm, a ritual. What does this say? <laughs> yeah, a ritual nonetheless that you are part of this group, right? Because military yes. culture is very specific and there's a whole mindset and ideology that I think does come along with the hair. I know that there were so many regulations related to even how African-American women could wear their hair and up till 2015 that people weren't allowed to wear braids or locks or twists or froze. In the military, you mean? Yeah, it was against code. But now kind of, they were saying it's a safety issue, but even thinking about what cultural hairstyles can be worn still being in the military. So it's a lot of politics related to hair. Well, that's like a coded aggression. That's We've seen that in other places in American society, obviously, haven't we? Like that... I'm going to dictate your hair. I'm going to pretend it's about, I don't know, sanitary or maybe, I don't, there's always like some excuse of what it's about, but it's like a coded form of discrimination, no? Absolutely. And that's why we I have- I mean, maybe not that coded. <laughs> yeah, no, it's pretty explicit, right? When we look at even some of these school policies and dress codes, that it will be very explicit that certain braids or twists can't be worn. And so the Crown Act developed in 2019, so standing for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. And it Mm -hmm. first passed in the state of California with Senator Holly Mitchell. But I think at this point, only 18 or 19 states out of all 50 have passed this, that it's against the law to discriminate against people based on their hairstyle, particularly in schools, for employment and even housing opportunities. But again, we still have further to go. I know it passed in the House of Representatives, but not in the Senate. And just even navigating that there's even resistance to saying you can't fire someone (laughs) for wearing braids. I don't know why that's an issue, but it's pretty ongoing, this, this challenge to protect these cultural hairstyles that's healthy for tightly coiled hair. And you've done some advocating on behalf of the Crown Act, right? Yes, I have. It's interesting. I never imagined that I'd be testifying in these spaces. Where were you testifying? Like you went to talk to legislators? Yes, I did. So I I, I went and testified as a subject matter expert in New Jersey, State Senate, Maryland, Wisconsin. It didn't pass in Wisconsin. <laughs> in, I think, Delaware, Connecticut. And some of this was during COVID, so I was able to zoom in. But before that was in person. 
you know, going up on a microphone and having people ask questions about the psychological significance of hair discrimination, ultimately, and the history of our hair. So I thought that was a pretty interesting way to translate some of the stuff I've done in the salon to then policy that impacts the nation. Well, these rituals that you've been talking about, Sure, there's some negative sides to some of these rituals, but the like sh- I'm making everybody shave their head in the U.S. military, but there's an importance to rituals. Even there's an importance to that, the group thinking, like you're now part of this group. But what can like hair rituals that you might have with like your mom, for example, the Sundays together, what can they do for us like mentally besides just altering our appearance? Because I imagine you left on Sunday evenings, you were probably in a pretty good space, right? Yeah, I, I'm just thinking about how critical it is that people feel taken care of and important. There's a lot of research that is coming out that there's an emotional transformation that happens when you get your hair done, that there are studies pre and post tests of a haircut and how that can actually lighten the load. Even things like, I have a research study called Strands of Intimacy, where I found that about like 96% of women, when they have a change in their relationship status will change their hair, whether getting a haircut. Breakup bangs. Yes, exactly. You got it. Changing the hair color so that these are big ways that we cope, right? We actually use our hair as a coping strategy and express to people that we're going through a change or... Is that a healthy thing? Because you see jokes about like, don't cut off your hair if you have a breakup or whatever. But I don't know. It sounds like that might be a way to to handle some of the stress, right? I think our hair is the part of our body that is the most easily manipulated, right? We can't change Mm. our skin day to day, our facial features, our weight, (laughs) but we actually Mm -hmm. can change our hair day to day. And so I think sometimes our hair holds a lot of our emotional energy. It reflects our mood. And so that since it's so easily shifting or able to be manipulated by our hands, that I think it reflects probably our wellness more than any other body part. Because I've seen research, too, about when people have alopecia or hair growth problems, how that can even lead to depression. And that's the... That's the flip side of what you're talking about. It can give you this power, but when you have problems with your hair, that really affects you emotionally too. And that might help explain it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, people go through a grieving process when they have hair loss. Even a study came out by Dr. Yolanda Lenzi in 2019 that said about 47% of Black women will have hair loss at some point in their lifetime, 47%. And so to be able to cope with and manage that, some of it is caused by things like traction alopecia in terms of creating hairstyles that are too tight, but also our factors of hormones, genetics, childbirth, malnutrition, stress, all factoring in. And so just even recognizing that some of those health disparities that exist within communities can even be manifested through hair and hair health and then hair loss. This special story is brought to you by our sponsor, Kate Spade, New York. Okay, you guys know how we feel about summer. It is not always easy breezy. Sometimes it's sweaty, frizzy. And if it is us, you know there's going to be bug bites. (laughs) Among other things. <laughs> Bring us back to fall. Why are we so anti-summer? We really shouldn't be. You know what? Because we spend so much time in the city, the subways, the scents, all of that. We're looking for a little bit of escape, a little bit of convenience. You know, that, that goes out the window once the temperature hits like 90. I guess. But I try and find a little bit of like fun and adventure even here in New York City. And it always just backfires. Remember? No, but it's there to be found. It's there to be found. Okay, I had adventure, but do you remember, I, it was, I think it was two summers ago, I went out to Jones Beach, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, I'm so romantic. Me and Eric are going to take a bike ride out. It was like a big, long bike ride, gotten some exercise. Isn't there something like very sexy sometimes about doing like a sport with a loved one? Like you get a little adrenaline going, whatever. So we're biking through. I've never done that, but keep going. <laughs> we're biking through like these nice little back roads to get to Jones Beach where we're going to go to the beach. And all of a sudden, like, I guess Eric biked over. Do mosquitoes have hives? I don't think they do. But like whatever he biked over stirred up a mosquito swarm. I don't know how else to describe it. I ended up with, all right, longtime listeners are going to remember the number and I don't. (laughs) 
but I think it was 37. Do you remember what I looked like? I had 37 bug bites. Oh and then God. I found out later they were tiger mosquitoes. Oh my God. Because we don't have normal mosquitoes here in New York City. Oh my God. It was my summer of misadventure. <laughs> the summer of misadventure. Oh my gosh. Well, so this summer, listen, we're going to be more prepared. We're going to look like those people who have it together. We're going to wear white. We're going to have cute little outfits. And we're going to pack the perfect beach bag. I got a new one from our fabulous sponsor, Kate Spade, New York. It's black and tan crochet raffia. It has the perfect strap drop. It's really cute. It's very me. It's neutral, so it goes with a lot of my things. And you look polished. I I love this idea of packing the perfect summer bag. I feel like there's so much you can't control in life. Like having everything you need in your bag is like key. So I'm just going to share a little bit of what I'm putting in my bag this year. I really think it's going to help. I'm not going anywhere without Band-Aids. I'm not going anywhere without like shout wipes in case I get a stain. Mm -hmm. Eric's very into white denim this summer. Great, Eric. You know what gets really dirty? White denim. White denim. This man really is, works at a men's style fashion magazine. He does work at Esquire. Yeah. And I got these little cutter mosquito wipes and sell it. It's the insect repellent in a wipe form. So I can like, if we're just going to, you know, something off the cuff and we do something out in the woods, I will be prepared. I always have my sunscreen, you know, a little, little essential oil. So in case I want to need to do some breathing exercise, you know, people are always like take deep breaths to help yourself like chill in the summer. I like to put a little like roll on, on my palms and breathe in through them and breathe out. Do you like that for me? It's funny. I just stocked up on my Tata. Oh yeah, mine's Tata Harper. Yeah. <gasps> They're so good. They're so good. Okay, I'm going to put those in my Kate Spade New York bag. And I think mm-hmm. that'll be, I'll be ready to have an excellent summer. And we hope you're all inspired to have an excellent summer. Pack your own little summer survival kit. Treat yourself to a new bag from Kate Spade New York. They have this incredible summer collection. Now it's their 30th anniversary and their summer of adventure not misadventure, of adventure. And they've got all sorts of new clothing, accessories, including a reissue of their iconic Sam bag that started it all back in 1993. You can shop their entire collection on katespade.com. And thank you again to our sponsor, Kate Spade, New York. Hey everyone, it's Jen. Listen, do you have a small business? Maybe you own a salon, started up a little beauty business. You should be using Shopify. Shopify POS is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. You get to track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Get hardware that fits your business, take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Plus, we have a deal for you. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash fat mascara. That's all lowercase, shopify.com slash fat mascara. Go to shopify.com slash fat mascara to take your retail business to the next level today. Again, that's shopify.com slash fat mascara. So when you do psychotherapy and you train stylists, do you also talk about this side of it? So they're not just looking for signs of mental health issues or perhaps abusive relationships, but like when they have hair loss, how to help their clients cope emotionally? Exactly. I've been able to do some hair loss support groups to even be able to navigate that topic and train hair care professionals to support clients with that, again, identity shift in terms of what happens when you don't match up with your ideal image in your head or how you looked in the past and how to cope with that. Oh, yeah. It's funny. We're sitting here talking about how a stylist can help their client. And I think about the reverse, which is like, oh, my God, how draining. You're a stylist. To sit there, you are with someone maybe six hours, depending on the style they want, whatever, and they're unloading their problems on you. I want to be, and I want our Fat Mascara listeners to be like better clients. Like, what's a healthy hairstylist client relationship look like to you? And what, where, where does it get unhealthy? Good question. Good question. Yeah, I, I do want to be clear. 
I'll, I'll say this very clearly. Do not expect your stylist to be your therapist, right? <laughs> In terms of <laughs> being mindful that you can get a therapist and have a hairstylist. But I'm laughing because it's like we do. <laughs> okay, yes, we will not. Let's not do yeah. that. It, I think that it's okay to operate and have questions about hair health or to ask your stylist, how how are things looking back there? And I have a stylist that I've been seeing for years and she will look at my hair and she said, Afia, you're not drinking enough water. Why aren't you drinking enough water? I'm like, oh, because I'm seeing so many clients and doing these things and I forget to bring my water. Or she'll say like, have you been eating enough fruits and vegetables? She can tell that by looking at my hair. So I think that it's fine to ask them if they see something or notice something about are your parts getting wider <laughs> um, or, or noticing thinning and things like that? Or again, the, the health of your hair. But I think that it's fair to t- tell stories, but maybe not stories that are maybe too traumatic for the hair care space. I don't want to say that yeah. you, there's a limitation, but being respectful to potential boundaries. I know on the reverse end, I, I encourage stylists to say, ask their clients, do they want a a talkative service or a quiet service? But I think maybe even as a client, we can ask, are you in the mood to talk today? Or are are you prepared or open? Do you Are you in a position to hear me tell some stories today? That could be a good question to see where the stylist yeah. line is at. If they have the capacity. Yeah, you're paying to get your hair done. You're not paying for like a new best friend slash therapist for the next however many hours. But we just to make it that assumption, don't we? Yes, yes. I think, but I think something happens. I really do think something happens when we get our hair washed. There's like a release, like there's a, a detoxification. That I think there's something about maybe it pulls us back to these early memories of childhood of getting our hair washed and bathed. I think that there is something that's happening that releases emotions. I've seen people cry during their hair washing process. Again, that particular phase and all the the steps and stages of getting your hair done, I think is quite emotional, the washing part. Yeah. And there's something about scalp stimulation. I It's funny because I was thinking about, I I just love watching people go to those Japanese head spas. Mm. <laughs> I've never had one. I really want to go. But just watching someone get their hair brushed or a scalp scrub, it's it's like those mirror, mirror neurons fire yes. up and you, okay, psychology and you feel major. the release too. <laughs> So, I mean, imagine being on the receiving end of that. It's even a stronger feeling. And yeah, I guess just being aware and you and I talking about this makes people be aware when they step into that salon space of like, okay, you know, this is an intimate space and treat it with respect in a way. So now tell me, we talked about your psychology career. Then you're mentioning you're a hairstylist, but like, did that ever become official? Did you go to cosmetology school? Do you still see hair clients or... These aren't just your college, like, dorm mates anymore. (laughs) When did you become a professional hairstylist? Yeah. Great question. So I did go on to graduate school, got my master's and my PhD. I ended up working at Columbia University's Counseling Center for a few years. And then I got a position as a faculty member to teach. And it wasn't until I became a professor, had my own private practice, that I then went to hair school. So I decided to go to hair school that specialized in natural hair. I chose not to go through a cosmetology program officially, which I probably will end up doing soon. But I chose the natural hair route in terms of I didn't want to give chemical relaxers. I wasn't Mm -hmm. interested in using like harsh chemicals, both for my own health and my client's health. So I tend to do more styles that are like braids and twists and locks, those sort of styles instead of using excessive heat. So really focusing on hair health and supporting people through a healthy hair journey, which cosmetologists can do. But I just, again, chose to go more of the natural hairstylist route. And so I had been working for years and years at N Natural Hair Studio in Silver Spring, Maryland. And so Mm -hmm. it would be pretty funny when people would contact me through social media or email me and say, I need a, I need an appointment. And I would often be confused, like for therapy or for hair. And so I always would get <laughs> confused or both. Like, And so it definitely was something to navigate because I was going in between seeing my therapy clients and running off then to the salon to see hair clients with all within the same day. Now, it's a very similar process that happens, but that's kind of how my journey has looked. Ever since the pandemic, I have not been doing hair in the salon. I made the choice to be a a telehealth specialist. So 
we need you. Thank you. We need more <laughs> of you, right? That's what I've, I've been reading about, like the shortage of people with your skills. Yes. And, and we are experiencing burnout. We are experiencing burnout because I have never been so popular in my entire life until the pandemic in terms of therapy appointments. Because in the past, you know, people would come and find me on Psychology Today. But when March 2020 to present, I, people are always trying to book appointments. I have wait lists, things like that, to the point now I have expanded my private practice to hire other therapists because just the need outweighs my ability to see people. I, I will never see more than 20 people a week in terms of therapy. That would overload me. And so now yeah. I'm trying to delegate and spread and have a staff to be able to support and give the highest quality care and attention to clients. So if you're not in the salon anymore, you still have this connection to the hair industry. I know you're working with Maui Moisture. How did that come about? And how does that play into like your clinical practice? Great question. All right. Th this was a, a miracle that happened to me with Maui Moisture. So I have just <laughs> been consistently doing research. I have a research lab, the psychotherapy research lab and publishing things and posting on my Instagram account, you know, just sort of fun facts about hair and mental health. And so I got an email from a rep of Mary Moisture in January saying that they wanted to give me a donation to support the training of hair care professionals in mental health. And so I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. That would be great. And then they followed up with like a team call, just, you know, get sharing information. And then they sent an email. They said, we've decided how much we want to donate. They said, we'd like to donate $100,000. I not only screamed, I sobbed. I'm like, little old me, how did you even find, like, just by me posting fun facts about hair and mental health. No grant approval process. It just came to you. And it, it was the, the gift that I could have never even imagined. I could have never a year ago imagined that someone would email me saying they wanted to give me six figures to support my mission of mental health and wellness through hair. Never could have imagined that. And so it has been so affirming to me because I never had people back me financially in this way to, to do the yeah. work that I'm doing. So just even being able to certify a hundred more hairstylists and these techniques can have such a broad impact to all of their clients because we know that if each of these people are seeing thousands of people a year and they have this skill yeah. set that then there's this trickle down effect. So I'm super excited and so grateful <laughs> for Maui Moisture in terms of even amplifying my voice because again, as a psychologist, we're not taught to even talk that much. <laughs> we're we're great listeners. And so to be able to amplify my voice and information and my unique skill set of hair and mental health has been so, so helpful and amazing. So if a stylist is listening, we have lots, actually we have lots of listeners who work in the beauty industry and salons and things like that. And they want to, do you call them hairapists? I don't know. Is there a yeah. name once you get a certification? Yep. A certified okay, okay. So if someone was interested, where could they go to be like, I want to be part of one of your learning sessions, or I want to, you know, get this training. What can they do? They can go to my website, psychotherapy.org. Okay. Maybe we could put that, that in the notes, but yeah. We'll put it in the show notes. Yes. Yes. She knows how podcasts work. <laughs> <laughs> I even had a podcast for a short period. It was called Psychotherapy with Dr. Afia. I had about 26 episodes. I missed episodes. that. I did all this research on you. How did I miss that? <laughs> well, it was just in 2019. It was very laborious okay. for me to manage being a professor, having a private practice. <laughs> Thank you. In the hair Thank salon. you for understanding. <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm like, it was short-lived and my sound engineer, oh, it, it, it was intensive. Even yeah, checking out our Instagram at Psychotherapy. And we actually have the listing of these monthly intensives. So they have been virtual mostly because of the pandemic. And it allows people to not have to travel and book a flight and get a hotel to get this certification process that it has been all online. But as things are opening up, right, we're outside again, I do plan on having in-person events. And so I'm hoping to use some of that funding from Maui Moisture to have a highly curated, beautiful wellness retreat for people in the beauty industry. Because earlier I was saying that people in healthcare are extremely burned out. But I actually would argue that people in the beauty industry might be even more burned out because, for example, for me, I never went back to my therapy office. I had an office that was about two blocks from the White House, and I just never went back after, I think, ended my 
lease in July of 2020. But hair care mm-hmm. professionals, remember it at a point during the pandemic that people were like protesting, like open up barbershops and hair salons. And I w- actually saw that hair care professionals were having to do way more labor, emotional labor for those people who had just experienced death and loss or loss of a job or loss of a home, all these different changes oh, yeah. that they were doing more handholding. They had to physically touch people throughout the pandemic and support people who were grieving and stressed. And so I really want to take care of beauty professionals that have become exhausted from doing this this work oh, for yeah. the past I'm thinking few about years. that like my dentist and my hairstylist were like the first people I saw other than the people in my household after the quarantine or like still during the quarantine and we were messed up then. It was all awkward. I was unloading weird socialness on them, like, because I forgot how to be. So Matt, I can't even imagine them having like 10, 20 of these people a week who are relearning how to be social creatures right in their hands. You know what I mean? Exactly. You're relearning how to be a human being, like, and interact with other social creatures is a is a thing. So yeah, that you're highlighting exactly what the experience was for them and even being cautious and not wanting to get sick themselves, right? And doing all of oh, these. Oh, of course. Remember, yeah. remember the cleaning procedures that they used to have to go through and like uh, disinfecting the salon space after each person or even only being able to see one person at a time, just all these different things that they had to go through physically and emotionally. Yeah. We're resilient though, aren't we? Like we are. I'm looking at, at humans. I just mean like if to talk to you maybe two years ago or three years ago, we both would have been in a weird place, I imagine. And here we are like, okay, we're getting through it. And you're giving people tools to get through it, all the kind of hard stuff in their life. I love that. I love that. I do have to ask about hair. I mean, you're still a stylist. Can we talk about products and beauty stuff too? You're bringing a look. You got a red lip on for me. Great hair, obviously. Who does your hair now? I I got my hair done a few days ago because I turned 40 three days oh, ago. Happy birthday. So, <laughs> thanks. So this is this is 40th birthday brunch hair that's a few days old. But it the person who styled my hair is certified in psychotherapy. So I think that's an advantage of then knowing the beauty and hair care industry so well that I'm like, I want this person to do my hair. I trust them and they, they, they're they certified. They can talk very well to me. So this this particular braided style is done by Camila. She's known on social media as Miss Hair and Humor. And so she is considered You know queen. she's a former guest on my podcast. Camille? What? Yes. Yes. Really? From like years ago. Uh huh. I know exactly who she is. She's the best. She's she's the knotless queen. That's her identity, knotless queen. And so it's funny because she's actually closing down her salon space because she's going on tour with Madonna again. And so I think she begins in June or July. And so she does hair for I think in the Black is King for Beyonce. She did hair for the Black female character in the new Sex in the City series. So I trust her in, in, in executing my Was this my the first birth- time you saw her for this look? Yes. So so I trust Is she as gentle time. as everybody says? So she's never done my hair, but I hear she has magic fingers. I fell asleep several times. <laughs> several times in the hair. What the a hair treat. Hair what a treat. So it's definitely magic, definitely magic. No tension. I could move my head all around. And and so that that even other times I've gotten braids, I've decided to use psychotherapists be, and other ones would like sage my hair first and put crystals. Like I really do believe in the the, the holistic okay. hair health piece. So. <laughs> okay. Now tell me about upkeep. What products are you using? What do you like? Do you have some favorites? Well, I'm I'm a good old fashioned water user, right? That's the only thing that moisturizes hair. But to seal in the water, I I am more of a leave-in conditioner person. The leave-in conditioners I like because of some of my salon experience are usually smelling super sweet. Maui Moisture has great leave-in conditioners. I've been using a shea butter. Maui Moisture Leave-In Conditioner, because they've been sending me products now that I can play in. Mm-hmm. Or even things like Alakay Naturals. We use that in the hair salon. It's like a yellow lemon grass leave-in conditioner. So I love leave-in conditioners. That works really well for my hair. My hair is sort of high porosity. And so kind of keeping my curls healthy. What else? 
I occasionally use some some gel, usually coming from like a flaxseed gel or I just love all products that have food in it. Okay, can I say that? I love when hair <laughs> we got lemongrass, have... we got flaxseed. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's my confession. I love a product that has turmeric or that has aloe, like Maori moisture. Like I like mm-hmm. when it's plant based. I I had been a vegan for like a good decade. I've Mm -hmm. started eating eggs recently. (laughs) And so I think I enjoy using plants in my hair care process. So if I see those early ingredients when you read the back of the label and it has some sort of like plant in it. Give you the botanicals. Botan- all, all of that. I love I love a good herbal-based hair product. <laughs> now, what about skin or makeup? Do you have any favorites you can share with us? Okay, so this lip, this lip yeah. is Lip Bar, which is a Black female-owned brand, but this particular color is called Rich Auntie. So I don't have any children yet, but I, <laughs> good do have lots there. Of <laughs> I do have lots of nieces and nephews and just even seeing the label in the store, like, yes, I'm going to manifest rich auntie. I told my sister who actually went to Princeton and my brother who went to Yale that I wanted to pay for their teenage daughter's first year of college. Now, one is in 10th grade and one's in 11th grade. So I'm a little nervous. I don't have it yet, but I'm to get them on the community college track ASAP. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's horrible. I'm horrible. Yeah. No, that is so generous of you. I would love to do that. So, Mary Moisture, if you want to give some more money so I could pay for my nieces to go to college, I welcome that as well. We could get some scholarships in your name. You know how, like, when you become a very well-known person, you can have the Dr. Afia scholarship. Look at you speaking it into existence. That's going to happen. Okay. For psychology I'm, I'm majors, for psychology majors yes. that connect to beauty. There it is. What a legacy that would be, though. That would be awesome. I, of yeah. course, your nieces and nephews could apply for it, but I just want to open it up to the entire world so that we I can like spread that. the love around. That's that. <laughs> if I'm going to speak I'll it into be being, auntie. let's just get the yeah. rules straight. <laughs> yes, yes. The the application criteria, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you've got your lip bar lip, rich auntie, who gives away scholarships. I love it. We didn't talk about scents. Do you like candles, perfume? I, I'm, I'm into essential oils. I don't want this, it to be any like endocrine disruptor or anything because sometimes people try to say, don't rub that on your skin directly. But I, I love a good lavender scent. Lang Lang, that's, I, I enjoy just even like a minty scent sometimes as like a diffuser in my space when I'm doing therapy because I need to, it calms me down. So I think that that's oh, a part yeah. of the, my scent profile. It's funny, you mentioned the that you love the products with the scent. I feel like that's part of the ritual, like a, an unfragranced, hair ritual for me would just, it wouldn't be as sensorial. Like I want to get as many senses involved as possibly. We've got touch, we've got sight, but like, I feel like people forget about that side of it, right? Yeah. You, you know, you know, the sensory experience. You were already talking about mirror neurons. So I know that you know (laughs) how the brain function and needs certain stimulation, right? In terms of our different lobes. All right, let's get off me and my nerdiness. Let's do the Fat Mascara 5. I have a couple speedy questions for, for you. What's the first beauty product you remember buying, like with your own money? All right, I'm going to go with the Super Grow hair product. I think it was like green. Oh, it was hair, it okay. like coconut oil. And I just would be grabbing it and trying to lay down my edges and do baby hair. And me and my friends would, would try to create all types of hairstyles with this really thick green grease. That would ha- smelled like coconuts. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Okay. What self-care practice gives you the most personal satisfaction? I love taking walks, especially in the spring. Like this time of the year, I love seeing the flowers bloom. I I, I like the breeze in my face. I usually am listening to a podcast or a, a book on tape. And so that that I just I'm I'm that lady who's frolicking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's a beautiful way to have self-care. Okay, what's your favorite indulgent snack? And people might not think this is indulgent, but my top two are acai bowls and avocado toast. I just love them so much. So anytime I travel, I just automatically put in my phone like acai bowls near me and just so that I can have one and taste it. I know that's not actually that indulgent. Maybe it's probably a lot of sugar, but I just like tasting different versions of acai bowls and love fixings on top of my avocado toast. Okay. Indulgence isn't always caloric because the minute you said it, I was like, well, that's an indulgence because like 
I'm sorry, the acai bowl down the street from me is like $12. And I'm like, it's fruit in a bowl. Right. So there's an indulgence. There's a monetary indulgence. Yes, it's an investment. It's it's pretty food. It's an investment. It's it's food bougie of me. Yeah. And yeah, no, also chopping up fruits and, and vegetables like the avocado, like these are things that take time to prepare. Having somebody else do it for you is such a nice indulgence. I, I'm fully supportive of that. Okay, what song or singer or band or whatever puts you in a good mood? Well, I am an Usher fan, and I definitely went to his concert about two weeks ago. But I'm a fan of Janae Aiko. Janae Aiko, I feel like, is really good in affirmations and like her music is such a vibe that I usually put it on to like write articles or work on books I'm working on and I just kind of get in a trance I don't even hear her (laughs) words sometimes but it's like I know she uses sound bowls and things like that that are addressing my chakras (laughs) so I do like her music a lot that's good and even when she has words you can still write and stuff to you just it just puts you in a in a place it does it does Something about her voice, it's not, like, overpowering that it's, like, I have to focus on it, but it just feels so fluid that that I get in a certain vibe. I love that. Okay, last question. What do you need to get a good night of beauty sleep? A cool temperature (laughs) in the room. Sometimes I put a little lavender on my pillow. I was the queen of hot baths, but I've stopped doing that. But I, I needed actually a bath a day in terms of, like, really hard core Epsom salt soaking, but I've not been doing that as much recently, but it would make me like pass out as soon as I would go into my bed. So something about the heat and then the cool would would relax my muscles and my mind. And I like to do the five minute gratitude journal. So at night you review your day and you identify three amazing things that happened to you that day happened to you or for you that day. And I think that that's a way that I can settle my mind instead of looking for like, but I should have done that and I should have done that. And why didn't that happen? That I have to like search <laughs> in the past few I hours. I was going to say was amazing. three amazing things like every day. Sometimes what day it's, where it's saying like, ha- having avocado toast it is sometimes one of like, the amazing things. I woke things. up on time. That's <laughs> like, I mean, some days are like that. So it forces you to sort of like look at the glass half full, doesn't it? Basically, you it's orienting yourself towards really great things so that you can easily detect it when it's actually happening. Like, oh, I'm going to write this in my journal later. That I, this funny text oh, that my friend does, sent me. Oh, it makes you more aware of good things throughout the day if you have that practice? Exactly. That's a good trick. Maybe I need to start incorporating that. I feel like you're start, happy birthday to you. I feel like you're starting off your fourth decade or is that your fifth decade, technically? Anyway, in such a wonderful fashion, and I'm so glad you had the time to come share your story with us and some of the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This was great. I'm like, can we do more of this? But no pressure, but I enjoyed myself. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, part two is coming, everyone. Thank you, thank you. We hope you enjoyed the show. It's your reviews and feedback that help us make the podcast even better. Head over to iTunes to rate and review us or email your thoughts to info at fatmascara.com. We also want to answer your beauty questions and hear what products you love. To share a Razor One product with you or to ask a beauty question, email us at info at fatmascara. If you send it as a voice memo file, we can even share your voice on the podcast. You can also do that by leaving us a voice message. Our phone number in the United States is 646-481-8182. Thanks so much for listening. 